Hello everyone! Welcome back to the 2020 Great Basin National Park Bio Blitz. If you came here straight directly, not from another video, my name is Amy Springer. I'm a graduate student at Utah State University and I will be your instructor for this third and final part of the Suborder Akenarinka series. Just to reorient you guys here, Akenarinka are the free living hemipterans. They have short bristle-like antennae, they have membranous wings that are not split into a leathery versus membranous component like the heteropterans, and they um, have a mouth part, as their name suggests, a canorinca means neck snout, they have mouth parts that are towards the rear of their head, towards where one might expect a neck to be. To put this in perspective of the Hemiptera family tree, um, suborder of Canarinca is here, and these are the six families I have chosen to focus on for this series. There are many more families than this. These are just the six most common and most interesting that I decided to cover for this bio blitz. And in this video in particular, I will be covering our final three families for this group, Membracity, Flatity, and Delphacity. So, the last video about Cercopoidea, Cicadidae, and Cicadelidae, the thing that those last families all had in common was this enlarged clypeus, or the upper lip of an insect. And that enlarged clypeus has grooves in it, in all these families that make the, it makes their face look similar to the grill of a car. These last three families that I will cover today, Membracity, Flatidae, and Delphacity, do not have that enlarged clypeus. So moving on to the first family, Membracity, is the tree hoppers. And you may have seen these around. They often look like little thorns. These are small insects. They're often the size of your pinky fingernail or smaller. And they, like most tenipterans, live on plants. So a few facts about their life history and ecology. Um, the tree hoppers are unique because they have an enlarged and often very elaborate pronotum that extends beyond their thorax. In other words, um, the pronotum is a plate on the back of an insect's thorax. It's one of many plates that make up the thorax. And in most insects, this plate is flat. It lies flush against the insect's back. But in the tree hoppers, the um, pronotum is instead enlarged and extends sometimes beyond the length of the abdomen itself, but definitely far beyond the thorax. And what I found really interesting, because I'm a geneticist, I like these kinds of things, um, the genes that are usually used to grow wings in most insects have been co-opted for helping to grow the pronotum structures in membracids. In other words, genes that are typically um, used in the body for directing the development of wings, telling different things like this vein goes here and you know this piece grows out of this part of the bug during the insect's development, those same genes, only in membracids, have been switched on during the development of the pronotum as well. And those genes are altering the shape of the pronotum as it grows, giving rise to these fantastic structures seen in membracity. The young and the adults are often found in different places. Young feed often on um, herbaceous plants, while the adults feed on trees, in some cases, not always. They can feed on trees. Finally, membracids are interesting because they produce honeydew, which is an excretion that's full of sugar, and it allows them to develop mutualisms with ants, whereby ants, which have stingers and are often quite aggressive, um, the ants will defend the tree hoppers in exchange for honeydew. 
Some people might say that the ants are farming the tree hoppers, or aphids, they do this with aphids as well, which are their cows. So, let's take a look at that uh, pronotum here. So, the pronotum, which again is a plate on the back of the insect's thorax, their middle part of their body, um, is enlarged. And in this illustration here, you can see this pronotum extends well past the length of the abdomen of this insect. Like other acanarhynchins, we have these short bristle-like antennae and uniform wings that don't have a leathery portion in front. Now, this pronotum can take a ton of different forms. As you can see here, this is an illustration of just a few of the forms we see in membracids. Many of these will be tropical, but some of them look just like a thorn, and others look like weird raisin things, and some look like... I don't even know what this guy's trying to look like, but there's a ton of diversity in this group, and they're very cool looking. And again, while it is often said that membracids have this pronotum structure for camouflage, or crypsis, trying to blend in with their environment by looking like the thorns of a plant, which these guys really do, they look like thorns to me on a branch, some of them really don't. This guy here, his pronotum, I don't even know what this looks like. Uh, it, it doesn't look like the thorn of any plant I've ever seen, let's leave it at that. And finally, as I mentioned before, their nymphs, or their young, look very different than the adults. Many of the nymphs I see around the western United States will have these bristles along their abdomen and bristles on their thorax. They can be dark, but they can also be green, they can be a number of different colors, but these sort of spiky guys that look like, yeah, little, little spiky versions of membracids, this is what their nymphs look like. So if you find little bristly spiky things on a leaf, you may have found baby membracids. And again, that looks completely different than what adult membracids look like. This is a common pest species in the western United States. It feeds on a variety of crops, mainly alfalfa. Moving on to our fifth family, Flatidae, or the plant hoppers, I included these not because they're very common, but because I think they're really neat looking. You can find them though, so I encourage you to take a look because they are really cool and we don't have that many of them. So a bit of life history, Flatidae, or the flatted plant hoppers, are one of the ocanorhynchins that communicate by sending vibrations through plant stems. So while cicadas will make a strong buzzing sound that you can hear, in fact so loud that you don't want to hear it because it hurts your ears, the flatids produce vibrations that you can't hear, and they're tiny vibrations that they send through a plant stem up to another insect on a different part of that plant, which is pretty cool. It's like they've got their own little telephone line in the plant. Another really neat aspect of this family is that their nymphs produce wax secretions that accumulate to form what looks like a little peacock tail. This wax, um, it provides a little bit of protection in that if a predator comes by and takes a bite out of one of these guys, they might just get a mouthful of wax that sheds off and the insect will go away free. It also provides a little bit of protection from dehydration. It helps keep the moisture in the insect's body. Flatids, unlike the previous families I've gone through, they are typically found higher up in trees. You don't usually find them in the lawns. And like membracids, they are often tended by ants. As I mentioned before, flatids aren't all that common in the U.S. However, I want to say that despite the fact that Bartlett et al. 2014 found only this number of species in each of these states, so two species in Nevada, one species in Wisconsin, um, I am from Wisconsin and I have collected a species of flatted from Wisconsin, 
that this paper did not show as being present in Wisconsin. So while they're not all that common, I encourage you to go out and try and find more because I have a feeling that there's a lot more than have been surveyed in different states. And so what we need is people like you to get out there and prove that they are here and they are in these states and in these locations. So that's your goal for today from me is to go find Latids. So how do we identify this family? For Flatids, it's all about the wings. So here I've illustrated a normal wing shape. It's just your typical, you know, elongated wing shape that you'd see on most Akenarinkans and in fact most Hemipterans. If we take a scissor, say, and we cut a piece off the end of that wing, what we end up with is the shape of a flatted wing. And while I don't think the family was named because their wings were flat, it does make it really easy to remember how to identify this family. If you found an Akenarinkin with a blunt-edged flat wing, you have probably found a flatted. Another really cool feature about these guys' wings is that they have an entire ring of marginal cells. So the margin is just the edge of the wing. It's the fancy name for just the where the wing ends, basically. And all flatids will have a submarginal vein, which is the vein just inside the margin or the edge of the wing. And all these little uh, spaces between the veins here, those are called cells. And flatids will have a huge ring of marginal cells, in other words, cells that adjoin the edge of the wing. So let's take a look at that on a real bug. So here is a flatted. This is an adult. And like the nymphs, they do tend to be fairly waxy insects. So this white stuff you see on its back, that's not mold, it's not flower, that is wax that the insect is secreting. But you can still see here, even though it's not quite as clear, these are all the marginal cells running up all the way along the edge or the margin of the wing. And again, that characteristic blunt wing edge. They're very triangle or boat-shaped wings. Here's a picture of one of their nymphs showing that waxy secretion again. This little guy is, definitely looks like a very fancy uh, white peacock or white firework or something like that. And this again, if a predator took a bite at this, they may just get a mouthful of wax which falls off and then this little guy gets to run away free. Flatids are really much more common in the tropics like most hemipterans. And while most of the flatids you find around Nevada and the western United States, Great Basin region, are going to be brown or pale green or kind of yellowish, tan, um, the flatids in the tropics can be really beautiful, very colorful. Here's an example of a, a very little spotted and polka dotted flatted. I think he's pretty cute. And I love this flatted's colors. That aqua and the yellow is just so bright. Very cool looking bugs. But again, most of the flatids you find around here are going to probably look something more like this. This is a citrus flatted. They parasitize citrus trees. They can be a bit of a pest. Um, so you may have a chance at finding these if you have a citrus tree in your yard. And finally, Delphacidae. This is another fairly uncommon family but I have found them before, so there's a chance you could too. And these are the Delphacid plant hoppers. Delphacids are mainly grass feeders. And they're, again, really small. All of these guys are small except cicadas. They're generally only 2 to 4 millimeters in size. We only have 312 species in the U.S. And despite that, a few of them have managed to become agricultural pests. Most of them aren't but a few of them are. For the most part, we don't grow many grasses as um, crops in the U.S. that these guys feed on, but they are a major pest of sugarcane, which is a type of grass, and it's where most of our sugar comes from in the U.S. Um, 
And finally, an interesting sort of quirk about delphacids is that the adults may or may not have developed wings. So this isn't something that is unique to this family. Aphids often have differential development of wings. Um, some beetles have differential development of the ability to fly. And this is basically a developmental switch. In other words, during the insect's development, if food is ample, there are, there's tons of food, they've got plenty of space, then there's no need for that nymph to have to migrate somewhere new to find new food. And so that plentiful supply of food causes the insect's body to switch on genes that prevent the development of wings, because wings would be a waste of energy and resources for that insect. On the other hand, if food is very scarce and they are struggling to survive because they are starving, that will flip on genes um, that cause the insect to take a different developmental pathway. And instead of developing these short, rudimentary wings, they develop long, functional wings so they can fly away and find a new food source. So again, not unique to this family, but it's a pretty cool trait that a single species, a single population, a single family of insects can produce two distinct adult forms. So how do we identify delphacids? There's one key characteristic, and that's pretty much it. And that is the single large thumb-like spur called a calcar or calcar. Not exactly sure how people want to pronounce it. Um, there's a lot of variation in pronunciation of these names in general. And this is a single large spur at the end of the tibia. And looking at this, these rings of spines, they look awfully similar to a sarcophagus. This spur, or the calcar, is the defining feature that separates whether an insect that you're looking at is a delphacid or a cercopoid or spittle bug. And the other unique thing about this calcar, what separates it from other types of tibial spurs, is the fact that this guy really does move like a thumb. So it can move back and forth it's mobile, it is jointed, as you can see here. It's a separate jointed feature of their legs. So let's take a look at this on a real bug. Also, it's not really an ID characteristic, but I personally think that delphacids have very unique looking heads and unique antennae compared to the other echinorhynchins. So something to look out for. And again, there's that little thumb or spur at the end of the tibia. And that's all I have for you for these families, so next I will be covering Sternorinca, the parasitic hemipterans, and I will talk to you more about that next time. Have fun hunting for these cool bugs, and find some flatids. I like flatids. See you next time.